world and welcome to this webinar from the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London. Today we are focusing on the gender pay gap and most particularly releasing new research by the Global Institute for Women's Leadership into gender pay gap reporting. The timing of this research is to coincide with the Generation Equality Forum in Paris undertaken by UN Women, which is seeking to put a global spotlight on all issues associated with gender equality and what we need to do to build back better, to use the phraseology, but to particularly build back with gender at the centre. So in the post-pandemic world, we have more inclusive workplaces and inclusive economies. We would be delighted if you would read the summary of the research. Uh, it will be available to you if you look at the question and answer function. There will be a link that takes you to the research document and I do urge you uh, to read it in full. It's a very important piece of research. It's been undertaken by Minna Cowper Coles, a colleague, a very valued colleague at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. Big thanks to Minna and to the team that she leads. Thanks also go to the UN Foundation for funding this research. They have been fantastic partners. We'd also like to thank the Fawcett Society, the Thomas Reuters Trust Law and Bowman Solicitors for their contributions to this project and to the interviewees for their important insights and their valuable time. To very quickly take you through the findings of this research, this research went to six countries across three continents and undertook interviews to look at gender pay gap reporting implementation. In that sense, this research project builds on work we have done before where we have compared legislation to see how countries are approaching gender pay gap reporting. This is going further, asking the question, do the words on the legislative page actually come alive? What difference do they make? And what this research finds is that different countries come at the question of gender pay gap reporting in different ways, but all countries need improvement and change. For example, I'm in the UK at the moment, and whilst the UK legislation comes up well on a series of comparative indicators, it doesn't come up well when you look at follow-up, what is mandated as the follow-up if major gender pay gaps are actually uncovered. So very quickly, what are we asking employers to do and government and those in the policy community and trade unions as well? Well, first, out of this research, we conclude that government and employers must be accountable and transparent. And by accountable, we mean accountable up as well as down, accountable to an agency that is overseeing the reporting, accountable to the board, to shareholders, but also accountable to employees, to consumers, to the general public, and that their gender pay gap reporting work must be easily accessible, not hidden on the back of the website somewhere that you can only find after hours and hours of interrogation. Second, we believe that there must be measurable goals for change. If you measure and find a gap, then it needs to be articulated and clear what businesses are going to do. They need to set time bound targets and measurable goals to which they hold themselves to account. And once again, because of the transparency and accountability, which others are able to hold them to account for. Number three, there must be a dedicated, well-funded body with the authority to impose sanctions. We believe that this will really shift the dial if there are agencies that not only just oversight the reporting, but have a mandate for change, that they are sufficiently funded and that they are able to impose financial sanctions when legislation is just intentionally ignored. We also believe that this must include all employers. When you do the comparative across the countries that we looked at, and uh, just to give you a sense of how diverse those countries are, 
we looked at my home, Australia, the UK, where I am now, but South Africa, France, Spain, and Sweden as well. So some quite different working environments and looking at those different working environments, you see different legislative requirements as to how big employers need to be to be involved in gender pay gap reporting. We believe that employers of all sizes need to be involved, particularly given what percentage of the workforce and the female workforce in particular is employed in smaller and medium sized businesses. Five, Gender pay gaps don't give you the whole picture. There are other issues to look at, uh, and we do believe that uh, data needs to be in a form which enables us to look at factors like ethnicity, first language, place of birth, uh, level and type of education to help us get to grips with what else is driving uh, potential pay gaps and the way in which uh, disadvantage can compound and intersect. Number six, we need to go beyond the headline figure. The headline figure might tell one story, but when we unpack that for subgroups, for occupational categories, for units within businesses, then quite a different story might emerge. So we need to get beyond the headline figures. We do think that there's also the need to raise standards to raise results. And by that, we mean that gender pay gap reporting can't be just a ticker box exercise. Okay, I've ticked all the boxes, I'm done. We do believe that there needs to be a concept of pass fail, of who's doing sufficiently well and who's doing badly. And that that kind of clear measurement uh, will over time enable us to raise standards, to benchmark standards and to drive change because uh, it will undermine any complacency from employers if they know that they are at risk of publicly getting a fail mark. Number eight, we also believe that there needs to be very clear support for employers and trade unions as they go about this work of data collection and of accountability. We think that government has a role here, employers have a role, trade unions have a role, and we need them working together with governments investing in this work. And number nine, we need gender pay gap reporting to be seen by everyone as one element of a package of support to tackle gender inequality in the workplace. Gender pay gap reporting is an important diagnostic. It helps us understand what is going on. But clearly there are a set of other issues, whether that be uh, work and family life balance matters, uh, parental leave, government support for childcare, unconscious bias issues, how we define merit, all the rest of it that needs to also be the subject of work. So gender pay gap reporting, a great diagnostic, but it's not going to give us everything we need for change. Against that background, I'm delighted to now invite a fantastic panel who have joined us to talk about this subject and to look at it from their uh, various lenses with their expertise. I'm going to invite firstly, Shauna Olney uh, to comment. Shauna is a great friend and supporter of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. She's on our advisory council and she is here in her capacity as an employment and human rights expert with over 30 years experience. She's the former chief of the gender equality and diversity branch of the International Labor Organization. Shauna, over to you. Thanks so much, Julia, for that really kind introduction. And it's really an honor to be joining you in this fantastic panel to talk about an issue that's really close to my heart. And let me also congratulate Mina and the team for the excellent and really timely report. Pay gap reporting is still the missing link in many countries, and it needs to become the new normal if we're going to advance gender equality in any meaningful way. Equal pay is an issue that I've worked on for many, many years. And we've seen a lot of progress, particularly around legislation. And I think you've mentioned this earlier. We've now got more and more countries that actually clearly set out the right to equal remuneration for work of equal value. And that, that was quite a long process, surprisingly enough. 
But there still remains a gap between the right and the reality. And gender, gap, re, gender pay gap reporting, say that three times fast, helps to bridge this gap. So this is a really important report, I think. When I first started working in this area, equal pay was seen as highly technical, really complicated. It was kind of the purview of a very small group of experts, um, a sort of secret society. And one of the things we wanted to do with my colleagues was to demystify equal pay. So we, we published an, an introductory guide on equal pay. And I think that was very important at the time. Now this was a number of years ago, just to look at some of those concepts and, and to make them clearer. I see this new report as part of this much needed demystification process. So over time, we've seen more pay gap reporting, um, but it's still pretty limited. But the report gives clear, convincing and very actionable recommendations, which really need to be disseminated and implemented as much as possible. One of the innovations in this report, which I really like, is it brings out not just the laws and policies, but it also looks at the perceptions. Perfect equal pay laws and policies are meaningless unless they have a real impact on real people. And if we wanna know the impact they're having on people, we have to ask them. So looking at perceptions, I think really helps to shape the insightful conclusions and recommendations of this report. And here I wanna talk about another report that also talks about perceptions. And I think it helps gives a, give a context for what we're talking about today. A few years ago, the ILO partnered with Gallup, the survey company, and we surveyed people in 142 countries and territories, a representative sample in each country. And one of the questions we asked them was about the biggest obstacle to women in the world of work. So we wanted to understand what was, what was blocking women at work. Now, if you look at the countries that are in this study, in France, Sweden, and the UK, the major challenge, the number one major challenge that was identified was unequal pay. In Australia and Spain, unequal pay was the second most frequently mentioned challenge. So if we really want to address women's aspirations, if they're important to policymakers, and if policymakers and others are serious about addressing gender inequality, ensuring equal pay must be a central component of that strategy. And now I'd just like to highlight a couple of points that come out in the report. And there are some issues that I think are, are of particular importance. First one is visibility. So what needs to be made visible? And we need to go beyond the headline figures, which I thought was a great phrase. It's not just enough to look at basic wages, we need to look at the whole compensation package and we need to go beyond aggregates and look at different jobs and different parts of the pay scale. Now this is important because we also see that if you look at the explained and the unexplained pay gap, so the explained part, you can explain it by education, experience, the sector you're working in, a whole range of factors. But then there's an unexplained part and that we can link to discrimination. And research shows that as you go up in the pay scale and as you you're advance in your career, that unexplained part of that discriminatory part actually gets bigger. So we really need to look at the different pay segments if we're going to address this issue. The other issue that comes out strongly, and, and I'll end with this, is the importance of accountability with action. So it's, it's not enough just to, to report, you have to do something with that reporting. Most equal pay laws are solely complaints-based. So it's up to the individual. They have to bring a complaint and it's just for them normally. And it's very timely, it's very costly, and it's very stressful. And there was one case I remember that took 25 years to wend its way up through the whole system and the results weren't, weren't super at the end. Now, if we have proactive equal pay reporting with action, this shifts the onus to the employer. So it's the employer that has to show that the pay system is fair and has to make changes if it's not. Reporting requires deep and objective thinking about the wage systems in place and the possible biases in there. And if we don't have that kind of reporting and that kind of reflection, quite frankly, I don't think we'll ever get rid of those biases. So I'm gonna end there. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Shauna, and thank you particularly for joining us at a most inhospitable hour in Vancouver. I'm going to uh, turn now to our second panellist, but before I do so, I'll remind people that you can submit questions on our Q&A function, and we will be trying to respond to audience questions. No doubt we'll get more than we can respond to, uh, but respond to uh, a number of them after the panel has spoken. Uh, so uh, our next panellist is Kieran Pender, who is an Australian writer, lawyer, and also a supporter of the uh, Global Institute for Women's Leadership. Uh, Kieran serves on our advisory council. Uh, he is a senior lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre and a visiting fellow at the Australian National University College of Law. We first got to know each other when Kieran authored the landmark 2019 report us to bullying and sexual harassment in the legal profession. And that was, I think, a leading report to give us a global indication of sexual harassment and bullying. And given a number of uh, issues that have been very explosively on the Australian public stage since, a uh, very important piece of work to help inform uh, Dimensions for Change. So Kieran, over to you. Thanks, Julia. And I uh, just want to e echo what Shana said, which is it's a real honour to be here today. I also want to commend the Global Institute for Women's Leadership for this really important uh, groundbreaking research. Uh, as a lawyer, it's um, my tendency to, to, be, um, uh, to, to take too long uh, to explain my points. So I promised Julia I'd be prompt. Um, so I just wanted to make three observations about the report itself and then three brief broader observations. Um, but there's a line in the introduction to this report that says that uh, the, the gender pay inequality is both a symptom and a cause. And I think that goes to the heart of this issue. And, and it, it gets to the complexity that we're seeking to unravel, that the symptom is multifaceted and the cause has multi dimensional impact. Um, and so bringing rigorous, uh, methodologically sound research to these challenges, I think goes to the heart of uh, the Global Institute for Women's Leadership's mission and is so, so important. Uh, as Shona said, so much gender equality legislation and frameworks uh, put the burden on individuals. Um, so, you know, pay discrimination is one example. Uh, sexual harassment is another great example. Uh, a systemic challenge that too many of the frameworks we have for addressing them put the sole obligation on the, the individual, the target of the discrimination or the harassment. And so research like this, which drives at the broader systemic responses to these uh, fundamental inequalities, I think is so important. Um, and I, you know, I really commend that uh, piece of research. I think the second point is transparency. Um, transparency matters. You know, it's, it's cliche to say that, that sunlight is the greatest disinfectant, but it's cliche because it's true. And we've seen a pay reporting and pay gap reporting in different jurisdictions being such a catalyst for awareness. And awareness is the first step towards change. So for example, I'm Australian as my accent probably betrays, but I've spent some, some time in London. And it, if you compare uh, gender pay gap reporting with us between the Australian model and the British model, a very uh, clear distinction is the level of transparency and the public accountability that comes with the British model. And so in, in my profession law, the, the level of scrutiny that the British approach to gender pay gap reporting brought to leading law firms in the UK, in contrast to the anonymised system that we have in Australia, I think really goes to a core difference in approach and uh, the, the British approach has brought, um, have been a much greater catalyst for attention. But as the report also says, you know, those headline figures can be misleading. Um, and, and I might come back to that. The third point, which the report also makes, and I just wanted to underscore, was the uh, importance of intersectionality in looking at these issues. Uh, I think gender pay gap reporting gives us a way in to look at a broader range of issues that all fall, you know, under this core issue of workplace inequality and ensuring we have an intersectional lens when we're looking at that and using this way in to seek to address this issue in its multiple dimensions, uh, I think is such an important opportunity. So I know, for example, in Australia, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, which has responsibility for Australia's gender pay gap reporting, is looking at additionally asking employers about their approach to sexual harassment, training policies, et cetera. You know, we can use this reporting mechanism to drive change, to prompt 
awareness, to be a, you know, both a, a carrot and a stick on, on a broad range of issues that all fall within workplace inequality, but have different facets. So again, I, I was really impressed by the report and, and commend it to everyone. Just three brief observations that go a bit bigger picture. The legal profession uh, is, is the one that I've predominantly worked in, in, in on these issues. And I think underscores that when you're designing and implementing and executing gender pay gap regulations and schemes, the devil is in the, in the detail. So it doesn't take gender pay gap reporting to tell you that the legal profession has a gender pay inequity. Uh, in most senior members of the legal profession are male, most junior members of the profession are female. We know that. Um, and, and so the numbers that we get out of Australia, out of the UK, for example, are not, are not a surprise in many ways, but they don't really unpack the, the more complex uh, inequalities that are going on within. So I don't think that there's much like for like pay discrimination in law. I mean, there may well be some degrees, but the numbers we see, for example, in Australia, it's 23% uh, gender pay difference in law. In the UK, it's 12%. That is not the result of like for like discrimination, but the result of structural discrimination uh, in terms of male progression in law at the expense of um, female progression. We don't address that with these headline figures. We address it by unpacking the complexity. And I think sometimes there's a risk that the, the headline figures distract from that task. Um, I think the second point is as these regimes continue to globalize, consistency and standardization will be of significant ben benefit. The regulatory burden that we impose uh, you know, is significant. I, I don't think we should worry too much about that if it's uh, leading to a positive outcome, but that efficacy is so important if we're going to impose a burden. And as we do that around the world, as these schemes multiply, having uh, minimum standards, having consistent frameworks will make it much easier for multinational employers and even for national employers to benchmark with each other. Um, so uh, ideally, uh, having uh, companies, uh, employers able to use systematic approaches in different regimes that are, that are broadly similar will make it uh, a lot easier. And, and, you know, we may not feel um, you know, too bad about imposing that regulatory burden, but the flip side is every hour that an employer spends on pay gap reporting is now that potentially the diversity and inclusion staff aren't spending on more meaningful things. Uh, so we want to make sure, A, this is meaningful, and B, we can do it as efficiently and effectively as possible. And, and, and finally, I think these issues get at a broader concern around pay secrecy. Uh, one reason among many that we have um, gender pay gap uh, in all, all jurisdictions around the world is there's so much secrecy around pay. In recent years, there's been a move in a number of jurisdictions to ban pay secrecy in contracts. Uh, in the US, there's a really good sample because some US states have banned pay secrecy clauses in contracts and others haven't. And there is uh, research that indicates that where pay secrecy is banned, uh, we see uh, a smaller gender pay gap. So uh, I, I raise that to sort of uh, highlight this broader picture that we have here that all feeds to this core inequality in our workplace, which is that women are not being paid the same as men, and that is a fundamental inequality. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, and a uh, number of great points there, and uh, particularly uh, my mind was drawn to the uh, impact of the pay secrecy legislation. That's good to hear. Uh, I'm going to go now to our third panellist. I'm going to welcome uh, Sharon Kimathi. Uh, Sharon may be joined by her cat, who's made a few appearances in our discussions before. Uh, we do welcome uh, uh, pets, children and everyone else as people work from home. Uh, Sharon is the Inclusive Economies Editor at the Thomson Reuters Foundation. And of course, uh, the Thomson Reuters uh, Trust has played a role in supporting this research. Uh, she joined that team after a two year stint as the editor of Informer's FinTech Futures and Banking Technology magazine. And before that, she worked as the deputy editor of the International Financial Law Review, uh, Practice Insight at Euro Money. Uh, so Sharon has got her eyes on many things legal, but in her current uh, role, particularly what we need to do uh, to create and run inclusive economies. So Sharon, over to you. 
Thank you so much for that introduction, Julia. Um, and thanks so much for having me. Yes, I do have my cat somewhere and she's probably giving me a little bit of time whilst I make the presentation. So uh, bear with me if she does make an appearance. Um, I'd also like to thank the Global Institute, the Fawcett Society, and of course, the Thomson Reuters Foundation in collaboration with Trust Law for their great work on such a detailed analysis on the gender pay gap, which helps form the debate and discussions that move this conversation forward. And what's been interesting to note from the report was a point about accountability and transparency. It's essential for gender pay gap reporting in order to be effective as employers should be accountable to their employees, relevant government authorities, their owners and their relevant governance bodies. And there was also the point about the pay gap reports being included in a company's annual report and sent to shareholders, investors, and other interested parties, which is interesting to note as we've seen a trend of new research aimed at highlighting the disparity between specific company statements versus what their actual employee statistics are looking like, employee testimonies, in addition to the issues faced by women in company supply chains globally. For example, we've seen legislative actions such as Germany's recently enacted supply chain law, which focuses on human rights abuses in businesses. Now, changes such as enacting supply chain laws will also help tackle the mistreatment women in the global South face when working for these large global institutions where most women are underpaid and face abuse and harassment. So once we tackle that issue, we can also face a holistic approach which I will mention as well. Something else that's highlighted in the report is also how companies are happy to follow exactly what the law says, but not necessarily go above and beyond that. So we need to be able to change the laws first in order to hold these companies accountable and incentivize action on the pay gap, because once that's addressed, companies can actually think about a more holistic approach. Uh, we've seen some companies who are thinking not purely about uh, the gender pay gap reports, such as Channel 4, Monzo uh, recently, who put in place policies that focus on um, miscarriages uh, and fertility leave and breaks or Bumble looking at mental health breaks, which is a step forward. However, it still does not address the main issue at hand. It does not focus on pay gaps. Um, and of course, as mentioned before by Kieran, um, people do need to be a little bit more open as well when it comes to um, their salaries, which will help drive the conversation and steer the conversation forward, especially from uh, a human resources and management perspective. Also noted in the report was how companies such as France and South Africa are going beyond just wages, and they're now considering other questions around racial equality, discrimination, and promotions in order to provide a holistic solution to drive the conversation forward and really tackle gender inequality in the workplace. Because once that's addressed, as mentioned earlier as well, when it comes to intersectionality, you need to think about the entire picture, the whole spectrum when it comes to employment, how someone is um, checked within their CV versus someone else. There are several factors that come into play um, that also pretty much uh, helps not move the conversation forward when it comes to gender pay parity. So once all these holistic issues are addressed, as um, noted in the report, that's when the conversation can move forward. But yes, yeah, so thank you so much for, for having me. And those are the main highlights that I picked out from the report. Thanks so much, Sharon. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to our final panellist, to Sam Moyston, who is a, a friend, an Australian, and has been an incredible leader on gender equality in our nation. She particularly uh, contributed to the work that changed Australian rules football, which for non-Australians might sound a bit perplexing, but for Australians, you know just how important that is. Uh, she has had a long career as a non-executive director and a sustainability advisor. Uh, she chairs a number of organisations, but very relevantly for our purposes, uh, she chairs the Australian Women Donors Network, which mobilises women's philanthropy uh, for women's causes. And she is the president of Chief Executive Women, uh, which brings together uh, leading Australian women to use their voices for change. Sam, over to you. Thank you so much, Julia, for that lovely introduction. And um, and like others on the panel, congratulations on the, the great work of the Institute and, and now this latest report, um, which 
tells us so much about what's uh, available to us to ensure that we get to grips with the fundamental issues of inequality, in this case for women through, through pay. Um, I'm tempted to start with suggesting that exactly the same report should be run across every sporting code in the world because a gender pay gap on sport would tell us much. Um, and we already see that with um, the paucity of women in the leadership and management of sport and, and even the athletes themselves. So um, perhaps we can apply um, your, your great work to, to the sporting arena at some point. Um, but I thought what I would do tonight, or tonight from Sydney time, uh, where we're in lockdown and it's quite rainy, so I apologise if you hear the rain on the roof here. Um, I thought, given the comments of the other panellists and the fact that Kieran has covered a, a bit about what legislation we have here under the Workplace Gender Equality Act, I might just reflect on a, on a couple of things that flow from your research and from your recommendations, all of which um, all the organisations I work with would agree with and would say we need to apply um, and, and apply well across every sector. But here in Australia, it is interesting to note that um, for a country that has continued to rate number one in the world for the education of women and has done so for many decades under the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Report, um, this year, we have fallen to 70th on that gender um, gap report to, for women's engagement in the economy. We're 50th overall for the gender pay gap. We're 50th for women's political engagement. Sadly, Julia, we don't have you as our prime minister anymore. Um, we have a, a very small number of women in our political system, but to fall to 70th in the world for women's economic engagement probably tells us uh, one of the stories that falls from the impact of looking at what's going on with the, um, with the gender pay gap in this country. And for a country as wealthy and as smart as Australia, it seems to me that that's a huge squandering of one of our most important um, uh, resources at this point. Um, for a country that talks about resources all the time, we are squandering one of our greatest human resources. So at, um, at Chief Executive Women, we've looked at this a lot and we, every year we look at um, a census that we do to see how women are travelling from a leadership point of view. And our last census of the Australian Stock Exchange top 200 companies revealed that only 5% of those chief executives are women. 5%. And in the year that we've just spent living through COVID, of the 20 chief executives that were appointed in Australia during that time, only one was a woman. And when boards were asked why there was not a, an appointment of women in that 20, they, were met, they answered um, very simply and said it was not a time to take a risk. And those boards wanted to go back and, and stay safe during that time. Um, so it says something about the kind of Australian ethos at the moment that there is a reservation about us as leaders um, and despite great work done by the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and the reporting that flows from that, we're seeing somewhat of a backlash when it comes to women's leadership. Um, and a couple of things to reflect on, um, I serve on a number of boards where we report to the, the, the WGEA very happily and work very hard on those boards to look at the gender pay gap. Um, but we're, we're part of companies that have big public investors who are interested in that data. And if you move out of that space into smaller companies, out into the highly feminised industries where many Australian women work, the capacity and the focus is just not there on gender reporting, a bit as we heard um, from Kieran about the legal profession. So in, in Australia, we, we have a significant problem coming out of COVID, which will need a lot of attention when we think about the gender pay gap. We need to think about the systemic barriers that, uh, that go beyond pay, but lead into that pay gap. Childcare, you've already mentioned, superannuation and the, the, the complete um, drop off in superannuation for so many Australian women, because our super system is predicated on continuous employment. And of course, we have some of the most insecure, casualised workforces um, in big feminised industries in this country for whom analysis of the gender pay gap is so necessary, but doesn't currently um, get done because it's not the domain of big companies with boards that look at this or the subject of investors um, who ask the questions that, that lead to better behaviour. And so where does that leave us? It leaves us with less women progressing into leadership. We know that when women do lead organisations, they actually close gender pay gaps across their organisations. They're safer for women and for men. They're psychologically safer. They're great workplaces because women look at the, the role of the workplace differently to the male model. Um, and women leaders deal with those big bulky issues that prevent the, um, the attraction and, and um, progression of women in the workplace. One last thought, I guess, coming out of COVID, Julia, is flexibility taught us that everybody can pivot very fast and there should have been some great opportunities looking both at the gender pay gap and gender opportunities for progress. But at CEW, we've discovered that the 
um, inappropriate and non-purposeful application of flexibility could, lo could lead to more women actually suffering greater discrimination by taking up the bulk of that flexible work, whether it's working from home or flexible hours. And if, if leaders are not purposeful about acknowledging that women and men can operate flexibly um, and continue to want to have a career and to lift themselves in an organisation and increase their pay and salary and conditions, if we don't do that purposefully, we may find ourselves entrenching further disadvantage for women in a more flexible economy. So something I think that might actually sit alongside your gender pay gap reporting might be the application of flexibility principles and leadership um, and, and the impact that women leaders have um, when they arrive at those top positions, albeit that we know the pathways um, are very difficult. And in Australia, sadly, um, a squandering of some of the greatest assets we have. But I'll, I'll leave my comments there um, to go to questions. But thank you for the, the report. We agree with all of your recommendations. And um, I'd like to think that Australia could, could continue to adopt many of the recommendations. Um, but a lot of it hit the moment here is fingers crossed and hoping for um, greater women's economic participation. Thank you very much, Sam. And I'm going to um, build on your remarks in my first question, and I'll just do a sweep through the panel. So uh, anybody who wants to comment, please do. Uh, you, you've raised the intersection between uh, COVID and uh, gender pay gap reporting, gender equality at work, and I'd like to drill down into that. It does seem to me that there's two potential futures in front of us. Uh, an optimist would say we are in an incredible world of change. Uh, we uh, all had to do things differently during the days of the pandemic. Ultimately, as the world emerges from the pandemic, uh, working structures will be changed. Obviously, many jobs need to be done in person, but we've shown uh, in this era that many can be the subject of virtual work. And an optimist might say in an era when businesses are almost rethinking everything, uh, can we uh, creatively put gender equality at work and gender pay gap uh, closing uh, at the centre of the rebuild? You know, is it easier to do something big when a lot's changing? Or... Uh, do we have the reaction, and I think Sam was indicating this, where businesses say to themselves, this is a hard old world, we've got to just concentrate on, you know, the bottom line, on emerging from a global recession, you know, don't talk to me about things like, you know, the gender pay gap now, I haven't got time, I haven't got space, uh, that can go in the to do sometime in better times basket, but it's not on my to do list now. I'd be interested in the panel's view which of those futures we might be moving towards and if it is the more negative version, what we can do to inspire change to make sure that we seize the more positive version. Uh, I'd be uh, happy to, to take anyone. Uh, Shauna, do you want to come in on that? Sure, happy to, Julia, thank you. Well, there's clearly choices to be made. Um, none of this is preordained, as, as you indicated. You could go one way or the other, and, and that's a that's a choice. So what do governments, what do policymakers, what do employers want to do? Now we saw after the financial and economic crisis of 2008, 2009, that women's wages were hit afterwards. So it's a real risk. We know that's, it's a good way for, you know, it's seen as a good way to just kind of save some money and, and we'll cut here, we'll cut there. And, and that had a huge impact on women. Now, what we've learned through this pandemic is a lot about inequality. So the crisis has really brought that to the surface. And you know, who were the most exposed to the virus? Who were losing their jobs? Who were facing increased discrimination? Who had increased care responsibilities? The impact on women has been staggering and that's been very visible this time. So I'm hoping that with that, we will have the positive future. We'll take this opportunity really to harness what we've learned and we've learned a lot. Now, my only fear is that people have very short memories um, so we can't be complacent. And I think it's important to keep the messaging out about you know, the, the need to make visible the value of work. Um, we know that you know, work by women has been historically undervalued. We've seen that in COVID. We're banging pots and pans. We're, you know, we're telling people what heroes they are, they are. But those people who have been absolutely critical to keep us going during the pandemic 
are still getting the low pay, the low pay and you know the the difficult contracts, the insecurity. So I think we can't forget that and we can't let anybody else forget that. If we want a better society coming out of the crisis, we need to strive for a more equal society and closing the gender pay gap is going to be key to that. So we just need to keep that on the agenda in any, any way we can. Thank you. Sam? Yeah, I might um, double down, I guess, on my, my earlier comments. Um, I'm a pragmatic optimist. So I would say this is the moment to go bold, go big. And um, because Australia is a great case study in that we have such a highly educated women's workforce, we have closed borders and we have not very high population growth. You would think that the most sensible thing to do would be to use every bit of the workforce opportunity of which women bring so much and is so underutilized. Now the numbers tell us that. So I, I think we should. My, my optimism is tempered by the need for really purposeful, outstanding leadership on this. We need to articulate this and actually say why the gender pay gap, fixing the gender pay gap and increasing the presence of women across the economy as economic participants, as well as doing a whole lot of that social heavy lifting is key to our prosperity and the vibrancy of the economy. We've got to link those two and not make it feel like it's another task to be done or somehow the ticker box. Um, and we can do that, but uh, you know, we're not hearing many leaders talk about gender equality and gender pay gap fixing as part of a vibrant economy. So my, my wish is that um, we get great purposeful leaders stepping up. We had one the other day in Australia, the president of the Business Council of Australia, Tim Reid, who said the focus must be on women's economic participation in this country if we are to be a vibrant economy. So he linked it himself. Good to hear a man at the top of the, of, of the blue chip company saying that but it will take purposeful leadership and a real eye for what's missing. And Bain and Company here has just done some really fascinating work to show in this country, we still think about women's work and men's work. And women's work is all around the home and family and caring for children or caring for older people. And when you unpack it, when they look at it, men and women's productivity is about the same when you don't have children. But when men and women have children and are partnered, women's productivity drops to about 70%, where men's productivity rises to 110%. The moral of the story is that if you have a wife at home looking out or a partner looking after your children, you're very productive at work. And if you're that woman looking after children or older people, you can't participate as much in the workforce. And so your productivity to the economy is not as great. That's a terrible way to think about families and shared responsibilities and how a society could actually value the work of caring. So you know, I'm all for purposeful leadership for your report, driving a conversation that helps us get there. Um, but it's with big fingers crossed because we haven't seen that yet. Um, and, and I think we've got to see some really big statements that help us get to that position of gender equality, closing gender pay gaps and women's leadership. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kieran or Sharon, did you want to come in on this? Kieran? Yeah, I, I'm also an optimist. And, and so I very much hope that this is the future we're driving towards. It, it'll uh, surprise no one on this panel and probably on this uh, webinar to, to, to know that uh, addressing gender inequality is good for business at a macro level and a macro level addressing gender pay gap addressing the prevalence of workplace sexual harassment you know there's considerable uh, empirical research that shows that that is good for business in individual workplaces and in the economy as a whole and so i'm optimistic that that will be taken up um uh, but as, as sam says that will require leadership i also hope that the pandemic, uh, I think, has really embedded data in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, every day we're seeing numbers of COVID cases, charts and graphs about vaccination rates, et cetera. On these issues, we are developing more and more really impressive and powerful data sets. Uh, you know, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency in Australia has really incredible data. As you know, Julia, from, from my work at the IBA, I'm a firm believer that data is the first step in driving change. But the key point is that the first step and then the second step has to follow. And so I really hope that we can use our newfound sort of global data literacy um, to drive change using the data we have around gender inequality, around gender pay gap, and take that to the next step and, and use that data to translate it into positive change. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, I'll come to you and I might get you to uh, just reflect on this COVID point, uh, but we've, I'll also get you to lead off on, on this question. We've got a question that's come in. Uh, what, about, what about teeth for gender pay gap reporting? Should there be penalties for failures to meet targets? How pro-teeth are we in this area? 
I would say what we've seen is that um, with campaigners and rights groups, they would much prefer that um, government put in, in place sanctions because that's essentially what will help steer um, actual movement and traction for gender pay gap reporting. I mean, uh, the, a report came out yesterday um, by the FT that noted how uh, when the British government gave um, corporations who need to report a break on COVID, a lot of them decided to not actually report on what's going on with their, their gender pay gap issues and, and any other um, uh, equitable uh, related reporting as well. So we've seen that in order to actually drive the conversation forward, you do actually need some penalties uh, put in place. Otherwise, these firms will pretty much do whatever they feel like, and that's often the bare minimum. Um, also, when it comes to COVID, I think uh, another part of the conversation that we often forget um, is that it's not just about flexible working for people um, in the office, it's also for frontline staff as well, and shift-based employees too. Um, in order to provide a remote, remote working environment that is a bit more accommodating to uh, part-time jobs, job share roles, um, or staggered start times, which can help with what we've been seeing, which is the motherhood penalty. Because um, that, that's something that um, was brought up too, is that um, another significant contributor to the pay gap, um, which is documented as well, is that employers often deny women pay increases and promotions and important assignments and are often signposting them towards cutbacks and layoffs during this COVID crisis as well. So uh, perhaps that's also another element that we're seeing a lack there of wanting to report on this data too. So uh, it would probably help to provide those sanctions and penalties in place for these companies in order to have some sort of motivation to actively target some of these requirements. Um, also in California, I mean, they had a new law just to put in a, a basic minimum requirement for um, women in boardrooms, you know, and that's also getting pushed back now um, in the States. So it, I, I would say the, the more that the government does to provide accommodating legislation um, followed by penalties, then we can see some, some action. Okay, views on penalties, yeah. Sam? On teeth, I mean, I think that definitionally, um, I think you can think about teeth in different ways. I certainly know now that the um, global capital markets and investors will use in the ESG, in the social and governance part of their assessment of companies, the failure to deal with the gender gap and the failure to deal with um, a safe place for women as part of the mechanism to determine whether they invest. So if teeth could also be um, a reason not to invest, many public companies that require that capital are looking to make sure they impress the ESG investors. Um, and that's quite a big movement. I mean, it sits alongside a lot to do with climate change on the E piece, the environmental piece, but it is really strong to see that investors get that there is a link between managing and growing the respect for women at work, closing the gender pay gap, rising women into or letting women rise to the top of organisations and company performance with um, less um, you know, great, greater performance, about a 5% lift in profitability when women lead organisations and less of, of the nasties, less of the gap growing for women's um, incomes, but also less of the bad behaviour that goes on. So if you link all of that, it's a kind of a different kind of teeth. It's not mandated by government, but there's a lot that government can learn from the fact that it's a big incentive for investors if you're a company or an employer that's doing that very, very well. It, it does attract the investor. And, and I think that that teeth can be uh, top down uh, in terms of investor pressure, but it, it can also be bottom up. And so we've seen in the past year, particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of employee pressure on, on boards, on senior leadership. Uh, we, we, we've seen that also in the climate space with a lot of employees at different companies expressing dissatisfaction with climate harmful activity. I think that's going to continue, particularly, you know, there's the, 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 the threat of the millennials uh, and, and the millennials coming uh, to, to, to address the, these issues. And, and I think that pressure from the bottom, from the top, means that although I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to the efficacy sometimes of targeted government intervention, it's not necessarily always the, the case that the government can and should fix this, but pressure from, from investors, pressure from employees can equally be powerful. Shauna. I'll add just one more piece in here and that's public procurement. And you've got, um, I mean, which is worth huge amounts of money. And you have some countries where if you can't show that you've got pay equity 
among your, your subcontractors, you can't get a contract with the government. Switzerland's one of those. So um, I think that's another um, carrot stick. It's, it's a little bit both. And, and as Sam said, teeth uh, can look differently in different places. Thank you. We've got uh, questions coming in on the uh, Q&A line. So I'm just going to round up a, a couple of them into one question people can buy in as much as they like to. Uh, one question that we've got is uh, gender pay gap reporting is point of time analysis, but what about lifetime earnings? What do we need to do uh, to think about gender pay equality for lifetime earnings? Sam went to that uh, a little bit with, you know, what are women's retirement earnings, which are obviously related uh, to uh, discontinuous uh, workplace careers because of family responsibilities, but any commentary people have on lifetime earnings. And then another question about uh, what's the role of women's leadership here? Uh, is there evidence, um, anecdotal or otherwise, that panellists want to bring to bear uh, of uh, women-led companies, greater number of women on boards, uh, women more in the C-suite, driving change in workplaces for gender equality and particularly the gender pay gap? I'm happy to invite people in if you just want to take yourself on mute, off mute and if we... Uh, have too many people talking at once, I'll uh, <laughs> work an order out. Um, I've taken myself off mute. <laughs> I think um, that point about lifetime earnings is really important and it's the big, it is the big gap. We know um, across most economies that women end up at the end of their working life with so much less than their counterpart men. And whether that's been because of taking time out for uh, caring for others, generally children, um, and gaps in the superannuation or pension scheme, um, or whether it's just they've never actually achieved the, the highest levels of income that men achieve, we know that that gap, and you can measure it over time, and you can measure it um, by, by sector, by um, education, by so many levels. And I think we, maybe part of the gender pay gap reporting should do more of this more generalised reporting over the life course of a woman. Because when you do see it and you unpack, when men are at their most, uh, earning the most money they can and are on a trajectory of gaining skills, that's through women's reproductive years. And, and unfortunately, that, that, that correlation is, is baked into the numbers until we get to a point where we say that care is a shared responsibility, um, not just women's work. Um, and so if you just do the analysis of a, a woman's reproductive life and where she misses out on those job opportunities and to increase her salary and to accumulate superannuation, it tells you why she ends up with less than three quarters of the amount of savings as men at the end of her working life. Um, so I think that it, it is important to look at point of time, but also the trajectory of women until we get to a language that says care is everyone's responsibility. Um, it's not women's work. Um, and we think about the incredible amount of unpaid work that's done and unvalued work if we continue to allow this to be the way we let societies think about women's work and pay. So I, I think it's a really important point. I, don't, I won't go into the women's leadership. I think I've made that point that I think women's leadership is key to so much of this and um, holding back women from those leadership roles is holding back some of our greatest opportunities for running better organisations and dealing with so many of these run-on effects um, by virtue of not employing women's leadership modes and, and, um, and focus. Thank you. Kieran. I wanted to jump in on, on the second part. Um, I think you know, the world would be a better place if all political leaders and all CEOs were female. Um, but I, I think, and certainly it's my anecdata that uh, working with law firms on issues of harassment and bullying, that uh, female leaders often are much more proactive. But I also think it, it's not the role of women solely to address these issues. And I, I know that the glass cliff phenomenon and the new um, director of uh, the Global Institute at the ANU, Michelle Ryan, who pioneered that, you know, it shouldn't solely be up to female executives to address these issues. These are not women's issues. They are societal issues. And they're as much, if not more, men's issues um, that, that men need to take ownership of. And so I think a really important part of this discussion at a pragmatic strategic level is how do we continue to engage and influence and persuade male leaders that they need to prioritise these issues? Now, you know, it should be as easy as saying, you know, you, you need to believe in fundamental equality and if you don't, how can you not? But we know that's not the case. It's not as simple as that, very sadly. And so I think an important strategic and pragmatic challenge is engaging with male leaders because the rea reality is most leaders in most parts of the world uh, at yeah, political level and in the C-suite remain male. 
yes, we can and should change that, but we also need to get them on board for this shift uh, for positive change. Shauna or Sharon, would you like to make a comment on either or both of these? Sharon? Yeah, um, I would say when it comes to um, looking at payment uh, within a lifetime, um, we also have to consider that um, women are often in really um, hard hit sectors at the moment because of the pandemic, such as hospitality, tourism and retail. And that equals to loss of earnings as well, because they can't really balance the two. And also informal as well, pay sector, the informal pay sector too, um, whereas it's, it's shift work as mentioned before. So that's harder to put in you know, money aside for your pension packet later down the line. I mean, we've also seen a, a penalty here um, in the UK where um, there's been a whole group of women who are reaching retirement age who sadly do not have the same amount left at the end of the day as their male counterparts. And there's been a, a lot of um, inaction as well in the government in order to actually rectify that disparity. Um, so it, it does have to do with leadership too. And, and when it comes to leadership, I mean, there was was um, a, a poll done um, earlier this year as well, and I think it was by the Institute uh, for Women's Leadership, uh, which reported on how there was um, the issue of pay gap was seen as political correctness gone too far. Um, so that's another thing that we've got to tackle is the mindset when we're talking about these issues is that, it, no, it's not just a, a, about that. It's about achieving a, a sense of equality for the work that you've done. Um, you need to be able to leave it in a comfortable position as your male colleague, and it, it often isn't the case. Uh, that's right. That research is available on our website. We did it in partnership with Ipsos Mori, so it makes a bit of uh, an eye... Uh, eye-watering a read in some senses, but there, yes, there was certainly a significant percentage of people that thought gender pay was uh, political correctness gone mad. Shauna. Just to pick up on this um, life course analysis, I think it is really important. And, you know, one of the things we hear as well is that equal pay is, you talked about political correctness gone mad, but also that it might be just for, for rich women, for rich people and rich countries. And it's really not. And I think, again, if we look at the life course, we see that that accumulative unequal pay um, ends up with far more women in poverty in old age than men. And I think that point's been made. And there's, and there's really solid research on that. So I think bringing that up is, makes it an issue that perhaps will resonate more with people. So I think it's really important to do that. In terms of the, the women's leadership, I just agree with everything that's been said. I think some wonderful, wonderful comments there. We do know that if you have more women on boards, um, on the board, you're likely to be more profitable. There's a lot of, of research around that. You're likely to have uh, more proactive policies. So again, I mean, there's we need to get men on board, on board <laughs> with the issues. Um, and we need to make sure there's a critical mass of women on boards and in leadership positions. We need, we need both of those things. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna do one very quick swing through the panel now, just one point on what people can do as an action agenda for change. We've done this research to launch a campaign to get people involved in improving gender pay gap reporting because that's such an important diagnostic. But if you can just leave people with one message of something they can go out and do, I'll swing very quickly through the panel. Kieran, let me start with you. Uh, two things, if I can, they should read it and then they should talk to someone else about it. You know, the people who are here, are obviously the people who are interested in these issues and are interested in addressing inequality in our workplaces and our society, they can share that knowledge with someone else. If everyone does that, the world will be a better place. Thank you. Sam? Um, like here and everyone should read the report and understand what gender pay gap reporting actually is to get beyond that political correctness uh, criticism. Um, but I guess... Um, if, you're, if you have a pension fund or you have a superannuation fund, see what you're invested in and see whether the companies that you're actually relying on for your future income and security actually do measure the gender pay gap in the companies they're in. And like Kieran, talk to as many people as you can, particularly men who um, should get very interested in this and see the, benefit, the upside for a society, not just the upside for women. Thank you. Shauna? Well, we often hear that money talks, and I think we need to talk more about money. Um, get rid of pay secrecy 
And um, as others have said, I mean, any opportunity to talk about these issues, to raise the report, um, to raise awareness about the pay gap and its causes, take, take every, every opportunity you, you have. Everybody has a sphere of in influence. We need to use it. And last inspiring word to Sharon. <laughs> as Iris Bonate, who's the Professor of Public Policy and the Director of Women and Public Policy Program at Harvard Kennedy School, once said, to move the dial on equalizing pay, we need to de-bias systems, not people. But of course, please do also go and read the report and ask questions, especially to your human resource management teams, because they are the ones who know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. A very big thank you to the panel for a lively and engaging discussion. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, thanks go, of course, to my colleagues at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership who do the hard work, most particularly in respect of this report, Minna Cooper-Coles and the team she led. Uh, thank you for producing this report. I know that there were days when it wasn't easy. Thank you once again to the UN Foundation for funding this research. Thank you, too, to the Fawcett Society, Thomas Reuters Trust Law and Bowman Solicitors for their invaluable contributions to this project. I look forward to seeing you again at a future event for the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. Thank you for joining today. Thank you very much. <laughs>